Hello, hi. Oh, that's me. Gosh, that's not. That's me. That's me. Gosh, you can see I'm short sighted. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Peraniuk. I'm a freelance journalist. I write about science and technology uh, for BBC, The Economist, New Scientist, and various others. Um, and so this is my talk. It's about design deception. Okay, so. Let's start with this. This is an email that I got in my spam folder. I don't know why it ended up in my spam folder, because Bill Gates is very clearly offering me $5 million, which is very exciting. Um, so <laughs> I read through this, you know, getting more and more enthused. And I, it's about all I need to do is email some personal details to uh, donation2015 at qq.com. Very simple, very simple. Um, and you'll be pleased to know that I didn't do that, because it's... Um, very obviously bullshit. And <laughs> spam like this is as old as the hills. You've all seen it a million times. Uh, even when your spam folder doesn't recognize it, you know what it is. Uh, we hate to think that we would be deceived by something like this, duped or tricked. It's like, oh, of course, no, we're far too street smart for that. We're far too savvy. Um, and we always worry about the Nigerian benefactors in our email box uh, trying to get access to our data. But we know that we, we feel that they won't. So we're pretty confident about that. But should we be? This is Emma Watson, an actor. Um, in 2012, McAfee, the antivirus company, published a very much discussed uh, press release saying that Emma Watson was the most dangerous celebrity on the internet. Um, in short, sites were purporting to purvey nude images of Watson, and people were going there to look at those naughty pictures, horny people, and they only realized afterwards that they were actually downloading malware. And so this was a vector. It was a, a honey trap. People thought they were getting something when, of course, they weren't. And they were duped into this just because of their you know, dark desires, so we say. So social engineering is generally something that's very, very important uh, to hacking and the distribution of malware. You know, hackers are you know, the really clever hackers. Look at someone um, you know, like uh, various people, like uh, Kevin um, I forget his name, but anyway, <laughs> sorry, Mitznick. That's it. Yes, thank you. I follow him on Twitter. But anyway, he became this famous. He, he he was excellent at getting people to give away personal details and simply uh, convincing people over the phone to give away key bits of information. And that, more often than not, is far more important to the success of hacking. Uh, than some fancy computer tricks or skills that you don't really understand. So keep that in mind. Um, this is the sort of thing you worry about. No, no hackers look like this. Um, <laughs> no one looks like this, actually. Um, this is just a, a ridiculous image. It's, it's used by the media all the time to kind of encapsulate the fears that we have about someone doing something nefarious. Um, it, it, it's an established fear. It's an exaggerated one, but it does exist. And it's something that culturally we're quite, we're always told about. Um, it, the fact is, of course, that deception is an established hazard in our modern world. We know that. And in order to survive the modern world, it's important to be attuned to it. It's evolutionary, if you like. Uh, but I'm going to argue that it's increasingly difficult, actually, to do this. Um, not because criminal hackers are all powerful or that technology is in and of itself uh, dangerous and destructive. Uh, those things are not true. Instead, uh, in this case, I'm going to argue that it's because design is getting much better at influencing our behavior. So here's A-B testing. We sort of touched on some stuff to do with this recently. A lot of you will be aware of this. It's very common in many industries now. The basic concept, though, is just that uh, two designs, slight variations on the same design, may be taken and shown to two separate groups. The group which responds best will therefore indicate which design is the more effective. And this you know, is a very old technique, but um, what's interesting is how intensely it can be done online. So if you think about a website and all the minute changes that may be made to that website in and out during the day, uh, this is, of course, tracking the conversion, its optimization. You, the people who run those websites know that some designs, even with subtle changes, are more effective than others. I'll give you an example. Google changed the precise hue of blue on their links. It's a very sl slight change. You wouldn't necessarily notice it. But apparently, it caused far more people to click on those links. And it, they say, impacted their revenue to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's important to realize that any time you go online, you are the subject of these experiments. 
You are the subject of thousands of experiments that you don't know. Someone is seeing a slightly different web page to you. Even app stores now are distributing apps publicly uh, in different versions. So you might download the same app as someone, but it's not. It's slightly different. Uh, a little bit strange. Now, you might not necessarily think that is there anything wrong with that, but A-B tests do sometimes stray into ethically questionable waters. This is maybe the best example of this. OkCupid okay, recently revealed that it had tweaked people's match score based on, it's supposed to be matched on the OkCupid okay, algorithm, the all-powerful OkCupid okay, algorithm, and they said that people were a 90% match for each other when, in fact, they could have been, according to the algorithm, as low as 30%. So people felt very upset about this. Um, OkCupid okay, wanted to see what ha would happen. I spoke to uh, one of their team. He said, well, you know, more people may have gone on dates, and we would have affected thousands of romantic lives, potentially, just by the simple test you know, that took some seconds to set up. But the problem was, so the public perception was, that the trust in, a, in an algorithm which they said was important, which they said was integral and did very important things, looking at your uh, likes and dislikes, your answers to questions, seemed to be more arbitrary all of a sudden. And people didn't like that. It's worth noting, uh, and there are plenty of psychotherapists here, that in the field of psychology, deception in studies and tests is something that people think very carefully about. You know, it's, it, tests and, and studies are meant to be designed so that deception is at, a, at its mim minimum and that it's not harmful or gratuitous in any way. So it's something in our culture that's established as negative. And we need to understand that A-B testing sometimes might cross into waters that a very well-trained and ethical psychologist may not. So one little example of where this all came from. Um, A-B testing, I'm told, in its current iterations, really originated with direct mail marketing. So all that junk mail you get through your door, people experimented intensely with the design of the envelope, the length of the letter, the type of font used, the writing. And of course, these days, this is all technologized. You can decide to get an envelope with laser etched addressees on them. So it looks like someone's actually used a pen to write it. And that, of course, then impacts when someone looks at it on their doormat, they think, oh, maybe I should read this. This looks important. Um, and of course, the costs of all this are mapped out very precisely as well. So people know exactly how to spend on a direct marketing campaign. Another example uh, I wanted to think about was skeuomorphism, uh, this sort of thing, stitching, leather stitching in an obviously digital app on your phone. Uh, it, it used to be very popular, but people then started to think it was tacky and somehow disingenuous. Um, if you think about it compared to what we do in the real world, I mean, fake leather trims on a bag, they're the sort of things that we, we want a bag to look a certain way, so it's designed to kind of satisfy that expectation. And that's going to be a key concept here if you think about satisfying or massaging expectations. Um, perhaps my favorite area of fakery and dupery at the moment is noises. So this is a brilliant uh, little story. An American football team, the Atlanta Falcons, were severely reprimanded because they were piping fake crowd noise into their stadium to disrupt the noise of their supporter, uh, the supporters of the opposing team. Uh, and so they were, of course, they were kicked out of the uh, league for a while. But the, the problem here is um, not just that they were disrupting their you know, enemy on the pitch. They were giving the impression that their team was more popular than it was. So if you were a supporter of the Atlanta Falcons, you probably felt quite reassured by that, even though it was fake. Um, earlier this year, we have the Eurovision Song Contest. Interesting allegations that Russia, they you know, performed their song apparently in the stadium. People said it was booed more than you could hear on TV. The accusation was that Eurovision used some sort of sound filtering technology to pull those boos out of the broadcast and paint a more positive impression. I actually know someone who's at the event, and she questions this. Right. She says she didn't hear as much booing during the performance as they did when Russia was getting a lot of points. Um, so I'm not exactly sure where the filtering might have been used. But even if it wasn't, and this is a scare story, it's still really interesting to think that we're so aware that we could be manipulated this, in this way and we're trying to be on our guard in case, you know, this is a completely false impression. Who knows? I don't know how many of you are androids, but uh, I haven't looked that closely. So this is, 
this is something that we're now attuned to. Are we being duped? However, let's, let's take a different look at this. Um, this is one of my favorite blog posts. You can find it just by searching how Siri works and Jeff Wofford. It's the guy who wrote it. And he wrote this really interesting blog about Siri right after it was launched. So about four years ago, Siri was pretty basic, still is pretty basic. But key to Wofford's point was that Siri is far from being an artificial intelligence. You know, the, as an assistant on your phone, it knows how to do some things you do already, a small number of those things, but you can kind of activate it with your voice. That's really all it's doing. However, what's interesting, Siri likes to sound as intelligent as possible and as characterful as possible. So Wofford describes this as the use of theatrics, uh, little turns of phrase. For example, if Siri might just say no in response to your question, but uh, it doesn't. It says something like, hmm, doesn't look like that. And if you think about it, this is very similar uh, to this device, uh, which is a bit older. So the, uh, the Magic 8 Ball uses these little linguistic tricks to make itself sound all-powerful and mysterious. And in a sense, that's exactly what Siri is doing. It's very simple, very age-old. There's nothing fancy about it. But we need that. We need that sense of something, an illusion. Uh, to, we need to be able to suspend our disbelief in order to go along with the idea that this is really clever and interesting and we, we, we would want to ask it more questions. Um, so if you think about uh, design and deception and so on, um, there are plenty of ways in which technology and our environments are actually prone to design deception. This, I don't know if you can see this. It says, this phone for decorative purpose only. <laughs> this is in America, so where a lot of people joke, actually, about how t you know, pay phones are non-existent and they don't work if you can find one. Um, but this is in uh, an airport, I think it's LA, and I thought this was curious. It cropped up on Reddit. It, it sort of suggests that, okay, Someone may just not have wanted to pay the money to get this phone removed and replaced with something else. But it's interesting that they were able to leave it there for decorative purposes, because it fulfills our expectation of what we see in an airport. We've seen airports in movies. They've got pay phones. It's like, imagine a future where there are no yellow cabs in New York. You might have yellow cabs wandering around for decorative purposes only, because we're so attuned to this expectation of yellow cabs in that environment. So, you might say that design that simply panders to those expectations is lazy, but it's very, very common. And there's one other aspect to think about. Um, we might actually need it to be like that. Uh, this paper is very well worth reading. Eitan Adar, Benevolent Deception in Human-Computer Interaction, and his co-authors, they published this uh, a couple of years ago. It looks at all kinds of technologies and web services which play with our expectations, play with uh, the reality of what they're actually doing. Um, and, uh, you know, the, a good example he gives is um, a website that is designed to fail gracefully. Okay, so if you load up a, an article on the New York Times website, you want the text of the art article. But you know that it's not just the text. It's surrounded by other modules, the comments, the advertisements, the most popular ranked articles of the day, and so on. Now, as a computer scientist, you would look at a system like that and say, well, the key thing the user wants is that article text. So we're going to make sure the system can stand that up wherever possible. The other things are expendable. Right? So we can do without the comments thread as long as we can get that text of the article there. And you can design a system to, be, to prioritize things in that way. The last thing you want to see is, I'm just going to skip forward, is something like this, which you've all seen many times. But error codes and so on, and evidence of a system breaking is something that you want to avoid. So that's maybe a more honest representation of what the system has not been able to achieve. Um, but it's not one that you want. It's not one that satisfies your expectations as a user, particularly if you're a casual user who doesn't really know even what a database connection is in this context. You know, that's just gobbledygook to most people. So getting around that is very important. And one other area which is in the real world, this has nothing to do with websites. Um, I wrote an article for BBC Future recently about placebo buttons. And these are very interesting. These are buttons everywhere which you press, all of you press them a lot, and they do nothing. But you feel better because of it. So think about, think about uh, pedestrian crossings. You assume that when you press that button, that's going to impact the interval at which the lights change. But quite often it doesn't. There are some traffic lights in London which the only times during the day when you can press it and it has that effect is between, I think, 2 and 7 a.m. So any other time, it's actually just on a schedule. However, you press a button, the light comes on, and you feel like you've done something. You've impacted the working of that system. You feel better for that reason, right? 
And that is called a positive illusion of control. This is Ellen Langer, is a psychologist. She wrote about this way back in the 70s. And it's interesting because she says, no, we need this. Say we went up to that traffic light and there wasn't a button to push, it just said on schedule. Maybe we wouldn't be as attuned to the traffic. We might put ourselves in danger because we just assume it's going to change at some time. Or maybe there's something socially binding even about going up to a traffic light. And you know that thing where you wait for someone to push it or you let someone else push it if they're kind of just... You know, there's something about that interaction that just helps being... It helps the whole business of living in a city. So she says, no, there are good things about this. We need this. We need this in our life. And that's kind of an interesting point. If you think about all these things, it's about making, like I said, the world, the modern world, which is complex and we don't understand things, bearable. We can live in this environment because it massages us a little bit and lets us through without too much interaction and confusion. So what we need to think about, I suppose, is that there is two ends of the spectrum. There's design like this, which is just what we want. You know, we don't want anything complicated. We want to feel happier in our environment. And then there's design which exploits us and design which is deceptive in a very negative way. So I spoke to a designer a while back who was very concerned about you know, uh, forms on websites which have checkboxes at the bottom and one statement of the checkbox is said, I do not wish, and the other one is, is worded, I do wish. But you check both because you, you look at the first one and you think, oh, I don't want any of that. But actually, you've checked one that says you do wish to receive horrible spam in the future. And then you end up with Bill Gates in your, folder, in your spam folder offering you money um, disingenuously. So that is a design deception which we would really need to question. It's an ethical uh, debate at that point. I just want to say, don't be deceived. Um, we've come sort of full circle there, if you think about this, this spam that's deceptive, and we come through the the technology which we'd rather was deceptive because it's better for us. Um, but if you think about those exploitative examples that I mentioned, um, you have to maybe question, how different is that um, from if the, if the corporation asks for your personal details or your money? How different is that if it's really just duping you from the spam artist in your spam folder? Anyway, this is just to say that a lot of the stuff I've talked about are in articles in my Secret World Of column at BBC Future, which I and my editor do encourage you to check out. Um, but that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks.